Welcome to The Landscape. If you're new here, this is a podcast all about the outdoors and America's public lands. I'm Aaron Weiss from the Center for Western Priorities in Denver, coming to you this week. We are outside near beautiful Bear Creek Lake on the southwest side of town, enjoying a beautiful false spring day before we get dumped on this weekend. Looks like we're going to get maybe a much-needed foot of snow or more here. Hey, a quick welcome to everyone watching this on YouTube for the first time. Uh, Because we have a special guest on the show this week, this episode is also on video. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do this for every episode, but if you do like it, let us know. We are going to get to Tommy Caldwell in just a minute, talk to him about his career as a rock climber and why he is using his platform and visibility to advocate for our public lands. But first, a quick news update. The Biden administration is moving fast to roll back some of the worst policies of the Trump years. The latest this week, reversing a legal opinion that gave oil and gas companies the green light to kill migratory birds as long as the companies didn't mean to do it. That bizarre interpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act had already been smacked down by the courts, but the Trump administration went ahead, started a rulemaking on it anyway. They weren't able to get it done in time. So as of right now, the Biden administration has killed both the rulemaking and the legal opinion that preceded it. So hopefully that is the end of that and more birds will live because of it. The Biden team is also moving ahead with its top-to-bottom review of the oil and gas leasing system. This is that pause on new leases that we talked about before. Industry groups have been predicting the end of the world for them, even as oil CEOs admit to investors they're doing just fine. Well, go ahead and circle March 25th on your calendar. That's when the Interior Department is going to hold a day-long forum on oil and gas leasing, both onshore and offshore. You can expect to hear from oil companies, taxpayer advocates, labor unions, conservation groups, and more. The department says it's going to open up a way for the public to weigh in as well. Stay tuned on that. In terms of a timeline, Interior says we will see an interim report on oil and gas leasing early this summer. And also, it looks like Deb Holland is going to be confirmed as Interior Secretary in the coming days. Folks I have talked to say to watch for a final vote maybe as early as this Friday, maybe early next week. It's clear Majority Leader Chuck Schumer wants to get Holland confirmed well before the Senate leaves town for its spring recess at the end of March. And with that, I'm going to go inside, change my clothes. We'll call up Tommy Caldwell. Our guest this week has been described as a visionary, as the best all-around rock climber on the planet. Uh, He is, regardless of which superlatives you want to use, undoubtedly a legend in his field. He's also an author, a star of multiple documentaries, and now he's also a public lands advocate. Tommy Caldwell, welcome to The Landscape. Uh, Yeah, great to be here, Aaron. I'm blushing. I'm glad this is an audio recording, honestly. (laughs) Well, we we may use a little bit of the video along the way, too, but you can't see you blushing too much. Um, All right. (laughs) I, I could spend this entire podcast just going over your biography, but that would be boring. Uh, so for folks who don't know just a couple of the very brief highlights from Tommy's career, uh, the biggest was in 2015, uh, when Tommy and his climbing partner, Kevin Jorgensen completed the first free climb of the Dawn wall of El Capitan in Yosemite. That's a feat that a lot of climbers thought wasn't just hard, but downright impossible at the time, it was a 19-day climb. It made national news. It was turned into a documentary called The Dawn Wall, which you can find right now on Netflix, and I highly recommend you go watch. Uh, if you saw the film Free Solo about Alex Honnold's free climb up a different route on El Capitan, Tommy is also all over that. And his memoir is called The Push, A Climber's Search for the Path. It recounts not just his climb up El Capitan, but also getting taken hostage in Kyrgyzstan in 2000. That was an ordeal that ended when he pushed the last remaining kidnapper off a cliff. Uh, And we will talk briefly about that later on. But since we have all of that stuff out of the way, I want to start with the public lands and work our way from there back to climbing. So last September, I suspect a lot of people were surprised. You wrote an op-ed in the newspaper in Loveland, Colorado, about the need to reform the federal government's oil and gas leasing system. So why, on top of everything else you do, do you then go and get interested in environmental and energy policy? I mean, I 
I mean, well, it started a few years ago when um, lobbyists um, for several companies kind of realized that if you bring these people to DC that have a bit of star power, you get like senators and politicians <laughs> and stuff like that in the room a little bit more. And at first, I thought this was a super strange idea, but I, I was curious about how the the cake is cut with policy in DC, and so I started showing up at these events, and um, and I think that opened my eyes to a lot of things. The first one being that my voice could have an impact. Um, and, and it also kind of clued me into how much of an impact on our lives policy has. Like these, these lawmakers are directing everything about how we live and how we recreate and what we eat and kind of everything. And, um, and so when you combine that with sort of my history um, being in the outdoors and my intimacy with nature and the fact that I've been seeing changes I guess all those things kind of came together and made me, and the fact that I have kids, that's a huge one, Mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure out how to protect the planet for my children. Um, All those things came together and I was like, okay, what can I do um, with kind of everything that I've been gifted in this world to make a, to make a better future um, for my kids and and whoever else I can impact. So you've, You've gotten, you've had an interest in oil and gas policy. You're doing climate awareness with Protect Our Winters as well. How does all of that play out then when you when you end up going to D.C. and meeting with members of Congress and and senators, things like that? I mean, generally, um, it it plays out through these big lobbying events. The first one that I went to, um, and I've been to four times now, I think, is called Climb the Hill, and it's really when about fifty climbers come together and, and, and the Access Fund, the American Alpine Club organized this event and they, and we just like storm the hill. We show up with a group of tons of climbers and, and outdoor industry business professionals and lawyers and stuff. And we take meetings wherever we can and we advocate for the things that we care about. Now that has been through that. I have developed um, certain relationships in DC that I now kind of foster through avenue, avenues on and off the hill. So when you go there, what are your your policy requests? What are you what are you advocating for at the very specific policy levels? Uh, assuming I mean, generally you're there, it's, it's what's, bills. Yeah, generally it's what's currently going on, like legislation that is currently being proposed or um, or that we're trying to further. So um, I've focused pretty heavily on public lands initiatives. You know, things like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Bears Ears, Tongass National Forest, you know, things like that. Um, but also general climate policy, especially with Protect Our Winters. I mean, I think with Climate Hill, it's generally public lands oriented. With Protect Our Winters, it's a little bit more um, climate change, but public lands are a huge part of climate change. So, What kind of reaction have you gotten are, from the, the climbing community and the outdoor community, the, the athletic community? Are folks grateful that you are getting into advocacy or do you get the kind of stay in your lane nonsense? I mean, both. I think generally people are grateful and the people that I really care to hear about are hear from are grateful, but you know, social media, I do do a fair amount of social media um, about sort of these climate change and policy initiatives. And I do get a fair, you know, quite a bit of blowback that comment about stay in your lane, stick to climbing. I hear that all the time. Um, which honestly, that does successfully make a lot of athletes pretty squeamish and not want to talk about this stuff. I think I've maybe built a little bit thicker of a skin in some ways just through a life of being a relatively public figure. Um, and so I, in some ways, enjoy the positive or the good dialogue that happens, even from the people who are naysayers. You know, I would say 5% of those people, you can end up having a good, intelligent conversation. The, re- the other 95% are just, you know, people just love to tell each other that they're wrong. And so I tend to sort of disregard that and just try and um, open up dialogue with the people who, who, um, who, who will talk intelligently about it. So, so walk me through your story, your connection to the outdoors. You, you have been climbing literally entire li- your entire life, but you've also been in, in the spotlight publicly for, what, 20 plus years now. Yeah, I mean, it was a gradual um, emerging into the spotlight and completely unintentional and still 
oftentimes I would say, um, not something I want <laughs> really look for, but you know, it is what it is. And so I try to make the best out best I can. But I mean, really when I started climbing, um, seriously as a teenager, that's when my, my name started to be noticed first through competitions and then through kind of doing some of the harder climbs in the United States and then through traveling so, sort of abroad. And the first time that I sort of broke out of the climbing world was that trip to Kyrgyzstan when it, which it made major like mainstream news. Well, you and Alex Honnold now, I, I would say have unique visibility, not just in the the climbing the outside magazine world but but outside of that world as well thanks especially to free solo and the dawn wall so do you feel is it an obligation or an opportunity to use that voice as an advocate for for climate and lands or or do you feel like that that adds the pressure to, to stay in your lane um, no, it's an opportunity and an obligation, I would say. And I mean, it's what, what's the use of being famous if you can't like do, do some good for the world for, with that, you know? Uh, I, I want to talk about the, the Dawn Wall a little bit, just because I, I, I did rewatch it the other day. And one of the things that, the, that it didn't show was the, the massive team effort that it took to keep you and Kevin supplied for 19 days on the wall there, walk us through the logistics of how, how do you get supplies and human waste up and down uh, for, for that length of time while you're doing something that has never happened before? Yeah, I mean, maybe just a real brief background for people who haven't seen the Dawn Wall. Um, this climb was a seven-year effort, kind of training and planning and um, and working the specific moves of the route for seven years and the 19-day final ascent, which is actually my third attempt at doing like a ground-up push is what I call it. And that's when you start at the bottom and you stay on the wall until you free climb everything to the top. Um, and so the logistics were pretty interesting. Every year we go to Yosemite – Kevin Jorgensen, my partner, and I would go to Yosemite um, in like late September. Um, but the good climbing con conditions don't happen until closer to the winter. So we would be working on the climb. You know, much much of it is like the, the climbing is so difficult that you have to really rehearse it the same way you would rehearse like a gymnastics routine or a music performance or something. You have to you have to memorize every single movement and really get it ingrained in your mind. And so we spend a lot of time doing that. But while we're doing that we bring supplies up on the wall and we start to establish camps much the way you would on like a big Himalayan alpine climb. Um, but, so but vertically. We had a camp. Yeah, but vertically, exactly. So we, we, we fix ropes to the climb. Like we climb, we drag our ropes up with us. We tie them to anchors on the wall and we leave them in place. And then we use ascenders um, to, which is a way to climb the rope to kind of commute around on the wall. And each time we go up, we bring, you know, port ledges and food and water and we stash it on the wall. Um, and then, and then there, this was a film project as well. So at some time later in the season, you know, our friends or just our friends who are the filmers really, they'll show up and then we kind of team up with them and our camp gets a little bit bigger and we bring more stuff up there. And, um, and then on the final 19 day push, we had ropes fixed to the ground. And, um, so oftentimes to charge batteries for the camera crew, somebody would have to, you know, one of them would have to go down kind of the rule state that Kevin and I have to stay on the wall the whole time. Um, but one of them would go down. And so when they're coming back up, sometimes they'd bring more food or water. And what that does is effectively make it so you could theoretically stay on the wall, you know, sort of indefinitely until you finish the climb. Let me ask about that, the climbing while you're shooting, knowing that you've got folks making documentaries as you're doing this, you know, the Dawn Wall first, and then Free Solo comes along. Alex is also climbing El Cap. Up, it's up an established route, but with no ropes. Is there a point at which that need to prove yourself or make films or set records can create too much uh, of a risk for the sport or for folks who see what's going on and aren't prepared, certainly aren't a an Alex Honnold uh, or, or a Tommy Caldwell in terms of their skill. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the answer to that is very different for Free Solo than it was for the Don Wall. Um, the Don Wall... I was very convinced that it was not a life-threatening endeavor. You know, we were using ropes. We were on a very sheer part of the wall. We may take long falls, but everything was well-calculated and safe, and I never thought I was going to die. 
Um, and so having filmers with you is, is something that I'm just used to. Like I've been doing that for a long time. Like I said, they're some of my best friends. If it was just me and Kevin up there for seven years, you know, we'd run out of things to talk about, but when we've got, we've got our friends up there, it just becomes like a, you know, big camping trip. And so you're up there on the wall with like four people oftentimes, and the view is beautiful. And, you know, when you're, when you're doing something that exciting, food tastes better it's just like this incredible like adventure with like four friends it's like one of the favorite thing one of my favorite things in in life and the filming doesn't impede that if anything i would say it enhances it because you know doing that thing doing that kind of climb in a group of four people is just really fun um and then and then i would say you know kevin when kevin joined the project i've worked on it for a couple years and you know he he actually got quite a bit of kodak courage like he was pretty pretty afraid of the climbing when it was just me and him up there and the first time we brought a filmmaker up there he got much more bold <laughs> actually helped him along <laughs> with the cameras watching um, yeah totally um so you know it can help at times but most of the time honestly you you're you're hanging out with the filmers at night but you forget that they're there while you're actually climbing you know they're really skilled they're they're conscious to not um impede the actual progress that much and they're trying to really be good documentarians and just like document what's there now free solo is a little different because the idea of um filming uh a climb that a lot everybody thinks that you might actually film somebody die that just brings a whole big question into it and you know the filmmakers i mean probably to this day jimmy chin is still you know it's such an interesting um topic to consider um, but free solo, you know, when you're free soloing something, it just doesn't take that long. Like I think when Alex free soloed, um, the free rider, it took him four hours, a little bit under four hours. And so you're, you're not living on the wall in the same way. Sometimes you might be sleeping on top of the wall and stuff, but, um, yeah, it's just different. Talking about speed runs uh, in 2018, you and Alex set another record there, the first sub two hour climb up the nose. And that's a climb that the experienced climbers usually do an overnight on and suddenly you two are able to do it in, in less than two hours. What's the allure of El Cap for folks who are not in the climbing community? Why is it so iconic and, and are there more records there you think still, still to be broken? I mean, El Cap is the center of the big wall climbing universe. It's the most accessible big wall um you know it's it's a mile from a road right in the heart of yosemite national park and if you just look at the thing it just looks incredible to to climb like it's any climber no matter what type of climber you're there you look up there and you get help you get heart help, heart palpitations a little bit you know it's just it's just right there and it's so amazing and and then on top of that the rock is so incredibly good um, a lot of big walls in other places around the world that are oftentimes more remote don't have that good of rock so um, it becomes much more dangerous. So all those things have made it sort of historically the center of the big wall climbing universe. And it seems to reinvent itself over and over again. Like when Warren Hardin did the first ascent, aid climbing it um, back in 1964 or something, I forget the exact date, you know, he, he was using a very mechanical method and people were like, oh, it's done. Like El Cap's been climbed. What do you do now? But then people come and they do harder aid climbs. And then my generation is about trying to free climb it. And then Alex obviously free soloed it. So you can kind of just pick the type of climbing that you like and you can find ways to sort of push the boundaries or break, break goals within those with, within that type of climbing. I'd imagine at this point you're a bit of a celebrity when you drive into Yosemite. Uh, do you find yourself looking for places where you can get out and climb uh, without uh, the the attention or or be a little more alone? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Yosemite Valley is a place that you kind of have to pick and choose when you're allowed, where Alex and I have to pick and choose when we allow ourselves to kind of like publicly show our faces. <laughs> um uh, but up on the wall, um, we don't mind running into people up on the wall. Um, it's really fun. Like when we were trying to do the speed climb, the sub tower two hour speed climb, oftentimes there'd be, you know, six other parties climbing sure. the nose that we would zoom past. And those little brief interactions are super fun for us and for them. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, all, you know, we're all just climbers and 
Yeah. And there's people come from all over the world. I mean, I think a lot of people don't understand that El Capitan is like this worldwide mecca. People from everywhere come and this is like a life experience. So when you climb El Cap and you pass six parties, you're passing six parties probably from six different countries and they're all having like a very deeply intense life experience so you catch them in this very vulnerable or very excited state it's kind of the coolest way to meet people ever you know i want to ask about overcoming adversity i I mentioned the hostage situation in kyrgyzstan in 2000 but then the year after that you accidentally lost a finger to a table saw so all of your biggest accomplishments as a climber have been done minus an index finger which you only have 10 to work with as a climber. How did, how do those traumas overcoming that adversity, learning how to climb again, minus one finger, how does the, all of that change your approach to the sport? Um, well, I mean, I, I feel like overcoming adversity is kind of inherently built into climbing as a sport, especially adventure climbing. Like I was trying to do it as a, 10 year old in the mountains with my dad like when we get in big under big thunderstorms and have to run down from these mountains that's like adversity training in a way and my dad always had a way of looking at that and being like these are the moments that that we are brought to life like adversity is what really kind of um instigates us becoming our best selves and so i've always been able to view adversity as that as such so you know, things like the Dawn Wall are kind of like intended adversity. Like I'm actually seeking it out because I want to learn more about who I am or my limits or whatever. But then there's the unintended type of adversity, like chopping off my finger or Kyrgyzstan. Um, and I would say those ones are the ones that tend to almost summon my best self even more. Um, and I think it's just a, I think it's just a matter of how I view it, like the way I learned to view it as a kid. But like, you know, after chopping off my finger, um, it's kind of like this combination of fear that I'm not going to be able to like do what I love and sort of determination to prove naysayers wrong. And sort of this belief that we are capable of way more than we kind of are, that that we understand on a day-to-day basis, like when these things happen to us that force us to overperform, that's kind of an exciting thing. And so I, yeah, I still, I seek those out. So you are doing things then that folks thought was impossible 30 years ago. What do you hope that the the next generation of climbers will do that your generation doesn't think is possible today? Where's, where, are the, where are those crazy out there limits? Oh man, it's hard to say. I mean, climbing is such a creative sport and people find creative ways to um, explore new avenues all the time. And I think the skill of climbers is like, is, is skyrocketing. Like if you, if you think of it as a, as like a line chart, it's like the trajectory has just shot up straight, straight up in the last couple of years because of things like the Olympics climbing is, you know, it's going to be in the Olympics next year if it happens. And, um, and sort of the, the climbing gym explosion around the U S that's being seen as a, as a good urban activity in climbing gyms, which is really bringing a way bigger gene pool into the sport than has ever existed before. So the skill, the strength of climbers is just astronomical right now compared to how it's ever been, but it's mostly in the gym right now or, you know, on boulders. And I'm sure that that will in the next 10 years or so bleed itself into all the different disciplines of climbing. And we'll see great, leaps and bounds of progress in, in all different disciplines. So a, a generation of gym climbers gets outside and starts hitting the big walls. Yeah. I mean, that's Alex Honnold right there. You know, he, 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 he was bred and grew up in a climbing gym and now he's the world's best, you know, free soloist and probably one of the best adventure climbers in the world. So you mentioned becoming a dad being part of what turned you into an advocate. How has being a dad changed your approach to, to climbing in the outdoors? Um, you know, I don't know if it's changed my approach that much. I mean, I try and follow my own dad's like example a bit in terms of using the outdoors and adventure as a way to kind of help, you know, give my kids the tools to, um, become life loving, 
you know, hopefully relatively strong um, individuals. And so we get our kids outside all the time. Um, actually, next week, I'm going on the road in our van for like, you know, a month or two with them. And, you know, nice. we probably spent four, four to six months a year going all over the place and climbing and being in the climbing community. And we meet up with other families. And it's such a it's, it's really, I mean, we're it's so incredibly blessed to be able to live this kind of lifestyle, but it's hard not to like love life when it's that awesome, you know, for uh, me and for what else? Kids, so. yeah, when you're not climbing, what else do you enjoy outdoors? You, a you, a skier, hiker, all the above. Yeah, I'm definitely a skier. I've been skiing a lot, um, lately cause we finally got snow here in Colorado. This finally. Year. Um, yeah, late totally. year. But. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I mean, I like I got into I did a trip to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge a few years ago with a bunch of ultra runners, and I was like, I'm gonna try and run a you know a hundred mile race, and so I blew up my Achilles tendons and oh. you know, tried to become a runner for a while, but I don't know if that's gonna work out. I'm really I've really gotten into mountain biking. I mean, I do love these really long sort of endurance um, adventure activities. So you know, I'll go out and you know ride my bike for 14 hours or you know i did a big link up in climb in rocky mountain national park with alex arnold this last year where we climbed like you know 12 we climbed basically all the major climbing formations in the park and it took us 36 hours and it's just like a good sort of um endurance adventure and so i'm always nice. looking for that and it doesn't necessarily have to be exclusively about climbing although when i do it in that climbing realm um it tends to, um, you know, I feel like I'm doing the thing that I'm sort of the best at. So that's cool. Back to advocacy as we, we wrap up here. Uh, you've got the Biden administration just getting started. I see, uh, I see Joe there over your shoulder uh, it, it, in the shot there. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's funny. What? Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I got the, I got the, uh, the celebration package from the <laughs> Biden administration, which had those. <laughs> so, so what do you hope that President Biden accomplishes for for climbers and everyone who enjoys the outdoors? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, there's uh, yeah, there's a lot. That's a big question, uh, but he's he's getting he's getting a good start on it. I will say that. Um, I mean, I don't know. I think people who care about the environment see this this period of time where you you know Biden is very pro environment and he's in the White House right now, and we and um, and also it seems like the environmentalists are you know the the party that seems to um, like to create policy for environmentalism is. Um, you know, in power in the House and the Senate as well. So we're like, man, this is the this is the moment we got to kind of push as much through as we can um, in the next four years because who knows what's going to happen after that. But I guess my my hope is that he will put us on a trajectory which will lead us to solutions to solve <laughs> environmental problems. I mean, that's a that's a big answer, um, and we could drill way down in terms of my ideas for how that can happen, you know, things like reforming, reforming the mining act, um, the mining and oil and gas leasing systems, you know, things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, our work when, when Biden got it, got elected, it's like our work certainly didn't end in some ways. It just, it just got going. So there's plenty of work to do. What's your message to your fellow climbers, athletes who want to get, involved in advocacy worth their time how do you get started how much of a commitment does it take and 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 where do you where do you first get your get your foot in the door there i mean i think the key the first thing you need to do is um experience nature in a way that makes you deeply love it and once you genuinely deeply love nature it's really all the rest lays itself out in front of you. As long as your mind and your heart are behind being an advocate, you're going to find your own path towards that. Um, I think getting involved in environmental nonprofits close to home is the way to kind of build the community because it's always you're always going to have a lot more power when you're surrounded by ideas and people that are working towards the same goal. So, um, you know, volunteering for environmental nonprofits is a really good way to do that. Last question. What's next for you? What's your next big adventure, project, book, film, whatever it might be? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, COVID's been kind of interesting because for the first time, I haven't traveled much for the last 12 years. And, um, you know, I'm starting to feel like it's okay to um, sort of leave the nest. And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to go and go to the desert in Utah. And there's some big sort of king line climbing projects that I know of down there that I want to try and climb. And um, they just happen to be right in the heart of Bears Ears um, National Monument, which is, you know, a monument that um, that Obama established. Trump rolled back, and hopefully Biden will put it back in place. <laughs> um, and so we're, you know, trying to advocate and make sure that 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 place is well taken care of. And so while I'm down there, I'll meet with, you know, with tribal leaders and so forth, and learn how to view the land from their um, perspective. And um, hopefully pave the path for people who go there to um, go on vacation or recreate to to know how to really um, treat the land well in a way that's going to preserve it because it's a very fragile landscape. Well, I can't wait. And to... also, I'm oh, big. Yeah. I mean, in terms of climate change, I'm I just advocate for keeping you know protecting these lands to just take them off the table for oil and gas um, development. Because I think, you know, as much as we can limit that, that's going to be our, our, you know, that'll certainly help a lot in terms of um, helping our carbon issues. Well, I can't wait to see pictures and hear how that trip goes from Bears Ears. Uh, you, you might run into Deb Holland, who just promised uh, that she would take a trip there after she's confirmed as secretary. So, you know, get some some quality FaceTime there with the cabinet secretary. Oh, cool. I didn't I didn't hear that news. Um, all right. Tommy Caldwell, rock climber, author, activist. Thank you so much for, for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Really great. Great to talk to you. Back here outside before the snow rolls in, that'll do it for this episode of The Landscape. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. If you want more of these episodes on video, let us know that as well, podcast at westernpriorities.org, or just leave us a comment down below if you are watching on YouTube. I also want to mention that next week, starting March 15th, is Latino Advocacy Week from our friends at Hispanic Access Foundation. There's a land protection workshop, an advocacy 101 workshop if you want to get started in public lands advocacy. There's a panel with the Latinos in ocean conservation as well, and a whole lot more. We've got a link to that in the show notes, or just go to latinoadvocacyweek.org. We'll be back here in a couple weeks as well. In the meantime, I'm Aaron Weiss. On behalf of the whole team at the Center for Western Priorities, thank you so much, Tommy Caldwell, and thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.